Early religious thought regarding predestination varied across ancient cultures, reflecting different beliefs about fate, divine will, and human agency. In Mesopotamian religions like Sumerian and Babylonian, gods were believed to control human destinies. The concept of fate, often represented by deities like Enu, the sky god, and Enlil, the god of wind and storm, played a significant role in determining the course of events and the fates of individuals. Ancient Egyptian religion emphasized the importance of divine will in shaping human lives and destinies. The goddess Ma'at, representing truth, balance, and order, was believed to govern the universe and maintain cosmic harmony. Individuals' actions were judged against the principles of Ma'at in the afterlife. In Greek mythology, the Moirai, fates, were three goddesses who controlled the destiny of every individual from birth to death. Clotho spun the thread of life, Lachesis measured its length, and Atropos cut it, symbolizing the inevitability of fate. Hinduism and Buddhism both incorporate elements of predestination in their religious beliefs. In Hinduism, the concept of karma dictates that individuals' actions in past lives determine their current circumstances and future destinies. Similarly, in Buddhism, the law of karma governs the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, samsara, with individual actions shaping one's future existences. These early religious traditions laid the groundwork for later philosophical and theological discussions about predestination, fate, and the nature of divine control over human affairs. Before we dive into today's video, here's something truly special for you. Are you ready to explore the captivating world of Hebrew language and culture? Well, hold on to your seats because we're offering you the chance to set your own budget for our beginner Hebrew class. That's right. You decide how much you want to invest in your Hebrew learning journey, and we'll review your registration. We're here to make it work for you. Plus, to kickstart your adventure, we're giving you three free introductory classes. That's right. No strings attached. So why wait? Take control of your Hebrew learning experience and start speaking a new language today. Click the link in the description to sign up now and let the journey begin. In Hebrew without Mikudot, you usually do get a Yud in there that often gives you a clue that the preceding vowel was either a Hirik or a Tzere. Okay, let's get back to the video and keep the excitement going. The early Jewish concept of predestination can be found in various texts and traditions, though it is not as prominent as in some other religious traditions. Here are some key aspects of the early Jewish understanding of predestination. In the Hebrew Bible Old Testament, there are instances of divine election, where God chooses individuals or groups for specific purposes or roles. For example, God chooses Abraham and his descendants to be a chosen people and enter into a covenant relationship, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. This concept of divine election implies a predetermined plan or purpose for those chosen by God. The Hebrew prophets often spoke of future events and outcomes, suggesting a form of divine foreknowledge. While this does not necessarily imply determinism, it does suggest that God has awareness of future events and may play a role in bringing them about. Early Jewish thought emphasizes the sovereignty of God as the creator and sustainer of the universe. While humans have free will and the ability to make choices, God's ultimate authority and control over the world imply a certain degree of predestination or predetermination in the unfolding of history. In rabbinic literature, particularly in the Talmud and Midrash, there are discussions about predestination and divine providence. Rabbinic sages grapple with questions about the balance between God's will and human agency offering various interpretations and explanations for how divine sovereignty and human freedom interact. Early Jewish writings, such as apocalyptic literature and prophetic texts, often contain references to future events and the ultimate fulfillment of God's purposes for the world. These eschatological expectations imply a predetermined plan for the culmination of history and the establishment of God's kingdom. 
Overall, the early Jewish concept of predestination is characterized by a recognition of God's sovereignty, divine election, and prophetic foreknowledge, while also acknowledging the importance of human agency and free will. The tension between divine providence and human autonomy is a recurring theme in Jewish thought and continues to be explored in subsequent theological developments. Augustine of Hippo, also known as St. Augustine, was a prominent theologian and philosopher who profoundly influenced Western Christianity. Here's a summary of Augustine's contributions to the concept of predestination. Augustine's understanding of original sin, inherited from his interpretation of the Adam and Eve story in the Bible, played a crucial role in his doctrine of predestination. He believed that as a result of Adam's fall, humanity inherited a sinful nature, rendering humans incapable of choosing God on their own. Augustine emphasized the sovereignty of God in all matters, including salvation. He argued that God's will is ultimately responsible for determining who will be saved and who will be damned. This divine sovereignty is a central tenet of Augustine's doctrine of predestination. Augustine taught that salvation is entirely dependent on God's grace, which is bestowed upon individuals according to God's will. He distinguished between efficacious grace, which irresistibly leads to salvation, and sufficient grace, which is available to all but may not necessarily result in salvation. Augustine believed that God predestined some individuals to receive efficacious grace and be saved, while others were predestined to remain in their sinful state and be damned. Augustine's doctrine of predestination sparked controversies during his lifetime and continued to be debated in later centuries. His teachings on predestination became a cornerstone of Western Christian theology, particularly within the Roman Catholic Church, and later within certain Protestant traditions, such as Calvinism. Overall, Augustine's doctrine of predestination reflects his emphasis on the sovereignty of God, the fallen nature of humanity, and the necessity of divine grace for salvation. His theological insights continue to shape discussions about predestination and related topics in Christian theology. In medieval theology, the concept of predestination continued to be a significant topic of discussion and debate, building upon earlier theological developments. Here are some key aspects of medieval theology regarding predestination. The theological writings of Augustine of Hippo remained highly influential throughout the medieval period. Augustine's doctrine of predestination, emphasizing God's sovereignty and the role of grace in salvation, provided a foundation for later medieval theologians to build upon and develop further. The thought of Thomas Aquinas, a Dominican friar and theologian, represented a synthesis of Christian theology with Aristotelian philosophy. Aquinas addressed the topic of predestination in his Summa Theologica, affirming the importance of divine predestination while also emphasizing the compatibility of God's foreknowledge with human free will. Augustinianism versus Thomism. Medieval theologians engaged in debates over the nature of predestination, with some following a more Augustinian perspective, emphasizing God's sovereignty and predestined election, while others leaned toward a more Thomistic view, which sought to reconcile divine predestination with human free will. Medieval mystics such as Meister Eckhart and Julian of Norwich offered unique insights into the concept of predestination from a contemplative and experiential perspective. Their writings often emphasized the transformative power of divine grace and the intimate union between the soul and God. The scholastic tradition of medieval theology fostered rigorous intellectual inquiry and debate on theological issues, including predestination. The University of Paris and other centers of learning served as hubs for theological discussion and the exchange of ideas among scholars from diverse backgrounds. Ecclesiastical councils and synods, such as the Council of Orange, 529, and the Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563, addressed theological controversies, including those related to predestination. These councils sought to clarify doctrinal positions and resolve theological disputes within the Catholic Church. Overall, medieval theology reflected a rich tapestry of perspectives on predestination, ranging from Augustinian notions of divine sovereignty to Thomistic explorations of the relationship between God's foreknowledge and human free will. 
These theological debates laid the groundwork for later developments in Christian thought and continue to shape discussions within the broader Christian tradition. In the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation, ignited by Martin Luther, profoundly influenced theological thought, including perspectives on predestination. Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546, Luther, a former Augustinian monk, played a pivotal role in the Reformation. As an Augustinian monk, Luther struggled intensely with feelings of guilt and inadequacy, seeking assurance of salvation through rigorous religious practices. His study of Augustine's writings, particularly on grace and predestination, deeply influenced his theological outlook. Luther's theological journey led him to challenge key teachings and practices of the Catholic Church, including the sale of indulgences. In 1517, he famously nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, sparking a movement for reform within Christianity. Doctrine of Justification by Faith Central to Luther's theology was the doctrine of justification by faith alone, sola fide. He emphasized that salvation is a free gift of God's grace, received through faith in Jesus Christ, rather than through human works or merit. This understanding stood in contrast to the Catholic emphasis on sacraments and good works as means of salvation. Luther affirmed the sovereignty of God in salvation and held to a form of predestination, though his views differed from those of John Calvin. He taught that God's election is grounded in his mercy and grace rather than in any inherent merit or worthiness of individuals. Luther advocated for the priesthood of all believers and rejected the authority of the Pope and the Catholic hierarchy. He emphasized the authority of scripture as the sole rule of faith and practice and upheld the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, Eucharist. Luther's teachings laid the foundation for the Lutheran tradition, which emerged as a distinct branch of Protestantism. Lutheran theology continued to grapple with questions of predestination and divine sovereignty, though Luther's emphasis on justification by faith remained central to its theological framework. Overall, Martin Luther's theological insights and his break with Catholicism during the Protestant Reformation reshaped Christian thought and practice, leaving a lasting legacy on the understanding of predestination and other doctrinal matters within Protestant Christianity. John Calvin, 1509 to 1564, was a French theologian and pastor who played a significant role in the Protestant Reformation. Here's an overview of his life, his theological contributions, and the development of Calvinism, including the TULIP acronym. Calvin was born in Noyon, France, and initially trained as a lawyer before undergoing a profound religious conversion. He became associated with the Protestant movement and eventually settled in Geneva, Switzerland, where he established a theocratic government based on his theological principles. Calvin's most influential work is Institutes of the Christian Religion, first published in 1536. This systematic theology text outlined Calvin's theological beliefs and became a foundational text for Reformed theology. Doctrine of Predestination. Central to Calvin's theology is the doctrine of predestination, which he developed as part of his understanding of God's sovereignty and human depravity. Calvin taught that God, out of his own free will and for his own glory, predestined certain individuals for salvation, the elect, while passing over others, the reprobate, for damnation. This doctrine is often summarized by the acronym TULIP. The TULIP acronym represents the five key tenets of Calvinist theology. Total depravity. Human beings, as a result of the fall, are completely depraved and unable to choose God or do anything to merit salvation on their own. Unconditional election. God's choice of the elect is not based on anything inherent in them, but is based solely on his sovereign will and purpose. Limited atonement. Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross is intended only for the elect, ensuring their salvation. Irresistible grace. The grace of God when applied to the elect is irresistible and unfailingly leads to their salvation. Perseverance of the saints. Those who are truly elect will persevere in faith and good works until the end, demonstrating the reality of their salvation. Calvin's theological teachings, particularly his doctrine of predestination and the TULIP framework, have had a profound influence on Protestant theology and church history. 
Calvinism became a major branch of Protestantism, with adherents forming Reformed churches around the world. Overall, John Calvin's theological contributions, particularly his teachings on predestination and the TULIP framework, continue to shape the beliefs and practices of Reformed and Calvinist traditions within Protestant Christianity. The Counter-Reformation was a movement within the Catholic Church aimed at addressing the theological and institutional challenges posed by the Protestant Reformation. It sought to reform certain practices within the Church, reaffirm traditional Catholic teachings, and counteract the spread of Protestantism. In response to the teachings of Protestant reformers, such as Martin Luther and John Calvin, who challenged aspects of Catholic doctrine and practice, the Catholic Church undertook measures to defend and strengthen its position. This included clarifying and reaffirming traditional Catholic teachings, including the doctrine of salvation. Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563. The Council of Trent, convened by the Catholic Church in response to the Protestant Reformation, addressed doctrinal and disciplinary issues within the Church. The Council's decrees reaffirmed Catholic teachings on topics such as the authority of Scripture and tradition, the sacraments, and the doctrine of salvation. Within the context of the Counter-Reformation, the phrase extra ecclesium nulla salus took on renewed significance as a rallying cry for the Catholic Church's exclusivist understanding of salvation. It emphasized the importance of belonging to the visible institution of the Catholic Church as the means of attaining salvation, in contrast to Protestant teachings on justification by faith alone. The Counter-Reformation saw the Catholic Church adopting a defensive posture against Protestant challenges to its authority and teachings. The doctrine of salvation, as encapsulated in the phrase extra ecclesium nulla salus, served as a point of contention and differentiation between Catholicism and Protestantism. Alongside its doctrinal and theological responses, the Counter-Reformation also saw the implementation of pastoral reforms aimed at revitalizing the spiritual life of Catholics and addressing abuses within the Church. These reforms included efforts to improve the education and training of clergy, promote greater piety and devotion among the laity, and combat corruption and worldliness within the Church hierarchy. Overall, the Counter-Reformation represented a multifaceted response by the Catholic Church to the challenges posed by the Protestant Reformation, including the reaffirmation of traditional Catholic teachings on salvation and the implementation of pastoral reforms aimed at renewal and revitalization. The phrase extra ecclesium nulla salus symbolized the Catholic Church's commitment to its understanding of salvation and its role as the true repository of divine grace and truth. In the 17th century, Arminianism emerged as a theological movement that challenged certain aspects of Calvinist doctrine, particularly the concept of predestination. Here's an overview of Arminianism, the Remonstrance, the Synod of Dort, and the subsequent execution of Arminian leaders. Arminianism was named after its founder, Jacobus Arminius, 1560-1609, a Dutch Reformed theologian and pastor. Arminius's teachings diverged from strict Calvinist doctrine, particularly regarding predestination and the extent of God's grace. Arminians emphasized human free will and the universality of God's love and salvation, arguing against the Calvinist doctrine of unconditional election and limited atonement. In response to growing tensions within the Dutch Reformed Church, followers of Arminius presented a document known as the Remonstrance in 1610. The Remonstrance outlined five key points of disagreement with Calvinist theology, including conditional election based on foreseen faith, universal atonement, and resistible grace. 1618 to 1619, in order to address the theological controversy surrounding Arminianism, the Dutch Reformed Church convened the Synod of Dort. This international assembly of Reformed theologians and church leaders met in the city of Dordrecht, Dort, in the Netherlands. The Synod of Dort rejected the teachings of Arminius and the Remonstrants, affirming the Calvinist doctrine of predestination as articulated in the canons of Dort. The canons affirm the five points of Calvinism, which were later summarized in the acronym TULIP. Following the Synod of Dort, tensions between Calvinists and Arminians persisted in the Netherlands. Arminian leaders, including remonstrant ministers, 
were subjected to persecution and discrimination by the Calvinist-dominated Dutch government and church authorities. Some Arminian leaders were expelled from the Dutch Reformed Church, while others faced imprisonment or exile. The most notable consequence of the conflict was the execution of prominent Arminian leaders such as Johan van Oldenbarnevelt and Hugo Grotius. Oldenbarnevelt, a statesman who had supported the Remonstrants, was accused of treason and executed in 1619. Grotius, a renowned jurist and theologian, narrowly escaped execution but was sentenced to life imprisonment. Overall, the theological controversy between Calvinism and Arminianism, as exemplified by the Remonstrance and the Synod of Dort, had significant political and religious ramifications in the Dutch Republic and beyond. The conflict highlighted the tensions between different interpretations of predestination and the extent of God's sovereignty and human free will within Reformed theology. So, Jacob Arminius not dead by Synod of Dort? You're correct. Jacobus Arminius, the founder of Arminianism, died before the Synod of Dort took place. Arminius passed away in 1609, prior to the convening of the Synod in 1618-1619. He did not participate in the events of the Synod of Dort or face its consequences. Instead, it was his followers known as Remonstrants who presented the Remonstrants, outlining their theological positions, and later faced persecution and consequences from the Synod's decisions. Thank you for the clarification. The Enlightenment period, spanning roughly from the late 17th to the late 18th century, brought significant changes to theological thought, including perspectives on predestination. Here's an overview of Enlightenment influences on modern theology. Enlightenment thinkers emphasized reason, science, and empirical observation as sources of knowledge and understanding. This emphasis on rational inquiry led to skepticism toward traditional religious dogmas, including predestination, which were seen as incompatible with human reason and freedom. Some Enlightenment thinkers, known as deists, rejected traditional Christian doctrines, including predestination, in favor of a more rational and naturalistic understanding of God. Deists believed in a distant, impersonal deity who created the universe but did not intervene in human affairs or predestined individual fates. Enlightenment philosophers such as Voltaire and David Hume critiqued Calvinist theology, including its doctrine of predestination, as irrational and morally objectionable. They argued that the idea of a predestining God conflicted with human notions of justice, freedom, and moral responsibility. In the 19th century, liberal theologians sought to reinterpret traditional Christian doctrines, including predestination, in light of modern philosophical and scientific insights. Liberal theologians, such as Friedrich Schleiermacher and Albrecht Ritschel, emphasized the importance of human experience and moral autonomy in theological reflection, challenging deterministic views of divine sovereignty. In the 20th century, process theology emerged as a response to traditional notions of divine omnipotence and predestination. Process theologians, such as Alfred North Whitehead and Charles Hartshorn, proposed a relational understanding of God's interaction with the world, in which God persuades rather than coerces creatures toward particular ends. This perspective offered a new way of thinking about divine sovereignty and human freedom. In more recent times, postmodern critiques of modernity and rationalism have influenced theological discourse, leading to renewed interest in predestination and other traditional theological themes. Postmodern theologians, such as John Caputo and Catherine Keller, explore alternative understandings of divine agency, human freedom, and the relationship between God and creation. Overall, the Enlightenment and modern theology have witnessed a diversification of perspectives on predestination, reflecting broader cultural shifts toward rationalism, skepticism, and pluralism. These developments have challenged traditional theological formulations while also opening up new avenues for theological exploration and dialogue. The Second Vatican Council, 1962-1965, marked a significant event in Catholic history, addressing various aspects of Catholic doctrine and practice. Extra Ecclesium Nulla Salus. This Latin phrase translates to, outside the church there is no salvation. It reflects a traditional Catholic teaching that salvation is found within the Catholic Church, which is considered the mystical body of Christ. 
While this teaching emphasizes the importance of the church for salvation, it does not necessarily imply a deterministic view of predestination, as Catholic theology also recognizes the possibility of salvation for those outside the visible boundaries of the church. The Second Vatican Council, convened by Pope John XXIII, aimed to renew and update various aspects of Catholic doctrine and practice in response to the challenges of the modern world. The Council sought to promote greater engagement with contemporary culture, foster Christian unity, and reaffirm the Church's mission of evangelization. Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, one of the key documents produced by Vatican II was Lumen Gentium, which addressed the nature and mission of the Church. While affirming the importance of the Church for salvation, Lumen Gentium also recognized the possibility of salvation for non-Catholics and emphasized the universal call to holiness. Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes, another important document of Vatican II was Gaudium et Spes, which focused on the Church's relationship with the modern world. This document highlighted the dignity of the human person, the importance of social justice, and the need for dialogue and collaboration with people of other faiths and worldviews. The teachings of Vatican II, including its approach to salvation and predestination, have had a significant impact on Catholic theology and practice in the decades since the Council. While some aspects of traditional Catholic teaching were reaffirmed, Vatican II also opened up new possibilities for theological reflection and dialogue, particularly in areas such as ecumenism, interfaith relations, and social justice. Overall, the Second Vatican Council represented a milestone in Catholic history, promoting renewal and reform within the Church, while also addressing important theological questions, including those related to salvation and predestination.